Rock and roll. Episode 11 of Coral Soapbox. Good morning, Coral. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, morning, everybody. Although it's probably evening where you're watching, but can I say that I just suddenly realized I'm wearing all brown today, so I hope I don't look like a giant turd. Because <laughs> it's 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 possible. Speaking oh, hang on! I've just to, lost. Of... I've just lost my picture. Have you still got the picture? Yeah, I can still see you. Oh, well, that's <clears throat> that's good then. That's good. I do. I do want to show. You, to... I do want to show you something before we start. Is, yeah. Well, I think oh, you've seen them, but I'm going to show all the fans because they look fantastic. Whoa! All drawn fan cards for the event. Who's that old lady? Look at that. I remember when I got sleep at night and I looked like that. <laughs> Actually, that's only about 18 months old, that picture. So No, they're fantastic. That's so they're brilliant. going to be for, that's the, absolutely uh, brilliant. for the event. And we just announced Sean Scully, who I had coffee with I on Tuesday. I know. And can I tell this little story? Yes. Uh, obviously, um, most of the Talking Prisoners fans are too young to know. Sean Scully was one of our very first bona fide film stars. He was picked up by Walt Disney. He was the star of The Prince and the Pauper, made in Hollywood, where he played both The Prince and The Pauper. And I met him when he was about 14 years old. Wow. Wow. Because I knew his mum, Peg Christensen, who any lovers of Australian soaps will remember from early days of things like Matlock Police and Division 4. Um, I think she was billed always as Margaret Christensen, but people knew her as Peg. So I am looking forward enormously to the event and saying, I don't expect you to remember, but I met you when you were about 14 or 15. And he's only three years younger than me. I was astounded because I was, I thought I was grown up, but I must have been about 17 or 18. So, But you do think and, you've grown up. And he's still, wor he's still working. He's still working. Working. Um, I, I was with and so he should. He was a really, yes. really fine actor. Very, very fine actor. So he should still be working. And I did actually create that character. I never saw Sean play it because it was oh. right at the end of my run. But I did create Dan the Man. Dan the Man. So there we, we had go. Stan the Man early on. Then we had Dan the Man. Dan after the Man. Uh, <laughs> we're um we're gonna do an interview with uh sean in the coming weeks and i had coffee with him in hawthorne he told me a really interesting story about spike uh spike milligan and it's gonna be great and it's yeah gonna be great to have him there on the Spike milligan was a very very good friend of my mum and dad's really and so i was lucky <laughs> spike milligan and my mum and dad and i we all happened to be in egypt on a uh tourist trip of the um pyramids and um we were inside one of the pyramids and um the floor was just dirt and quite filthy. And when you looked up, it was all beautiful tiles and mosaics and everything else. And Spike just looked up and said, oh, the cleaning lady must have been standing on her head because, <laughs> because the ceiling was clean and the floor was filthy. <laughs> now, I know you were uh, very big in theatre restaurants back in the day, but the sad news of um, John Newman passing away, who was the founder of Dracula's... Yeah, Theater Tiki and John's, yeah. Uh, yeah, 94 I didn't years old. I did, how old was he? 94. 94. Well, of course, Tiki passed away. His wife passed away a few years ago. Um, I hadn't even heard that he died. I've been so caught up with Janet over the oh, last... Oh, yeah, time. of course. And we got, we need to remember Janet. Um, we we do need to remember that we were so, so privileged. I mean, it's a bit like writing. You either decide, oh, well, you know, I will, I need to make a living, so I'll take what's on offer, even if I don't especially want to do it, or I have my artistic integrity and I'm not going to do anything for money. Now, I like to think you can be a bit of both, and Janet was a bit of both, 
as I was a bit of both. The problem is that when you do something for the money, um, predominantly, because you have to eat, you have to feed your kids, what happens is you don't have the time to do the things that you would really love to do. And Janet was a superb stage actress. I mean, literally, probably one of the best actresses we have ever produced in Australia. And in a way, I almost regret um, that she did, or that her agent had her audition for uh, Prisoner. I think Jan Russ posted this week, I cast her in Prisoner and I cast her in uh, Neighbours. <clears throat> well, you know that Jan is a friend of mine and I love her dearly, but I have discussed this before. Casting directors actually only shortlist the actors. So it's true that she shortlisted Janet along with several others, but um, a number of other people make the decisions. I saw her audition and one of the things I said is, well, she'd have to cut that hair off. She had hair right down to her waist and um, they said, oh, couldn't she play it and leave the hair? I said, no, the character's based on James Dean. She, or she could maybe wear a wig, but then people would say, oh, she's wearing a wig. And Janet, God bless her, said, hair grows, hair regrows, and she cut it off. And um, I've always admired how far she would go for a role. It needed short hair, so she said, right, chop it off, cut it off. She was a superb actress and a terrific human being, a caring, loving human being, and the world is a little bit worse for her passing. Uh, I've been surrounded by death the last few months, Matt. Oh, it's uh, it's getting very, very wearing. Uh, it, it really is. <clears throat> but um, all, also, did you know, you probably did know if you sat with Sean long enough, Sean was married to Wendy Hughes. Ah, oh, no, I didn't know that. You didn't know Sean oh, was no. married to Wendy Hughes. No, we didn't Hughes. talk about that. The great Wendy Hughes, one of our bona fide film stars, was for a time, I think they were married for about eight or ten years, married to Sean oh, wow. Scully. So oh. so there you go. Oh, I am so go. old. I have Breaking this wealth news. of information that I don't yeah. know where it comes from. I don't know how I remember it. Don't anybody say to me, and oh, and this is something I want to say before we start, because it does fall into the um, category of missed opportunities and disasters. If I say a story happened, I might get the time wrong or the date wrong, of course. but the story happened. Now, after the last one, I got everybody up in arms saying, oh, she's losing it, her mind's going, she's thinking of, she's telling a story that never, ever happened, she's getting mixed up with the Ellen Farmer story, blah, 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 blah. No, I am freaking not. I am telling you about a story which you cannot comment on because you never, ever saw it. Unless you are 60, 65 upwards and you also, and you watch this show back in 1980 when it was on, you don't know about this story. And the story was that we put in to the ladies prison a transsexual someone not someone dressed up in drag but someone who had had the operation and had changed from a man to a woman in that age you could not have your birth certificate changed now you can Kids now don't know how lucky they are. Imagine if you were transsexual now and you were a woman, but on your birth certificate, it said you were a man. So if you were found guilty of a crime, you would be put into a man's prison where you would be raped and abused. So we did this story based on fact, a story that happened in America and the entire story, pretty much only more so than the Edna Pearson story, was stripped completely from the show after its very first viewing. So the first time it went to air, 
people who would have seen it then saw this character for the life of me i cannot remember what her what her name was she was a very ordinary looking middle-aged woman and we cast a very ordinary middle-aged woman to play her um but she had been a man and she'd been put in pentridge and that particular story even though it never went to air was mentioned in victorian parliament and and was the beginning of the bill being made to say that you could change your yeah your your gender on your birth certificate so i don't want anyone saying to me i'm mixed up with the ellen farmer story that was a stupid story which didn't work because of the casting about someone getting in drag so they could stay with their girlfriend i know the story i wrote the story I'm talking about a totally different story. So yeah. please do me the courtesy of accepting that when it comes to all the stories I was involved in, I know them. You don't. So spare me the shit of, oh, she's old and decrepit and she's talking shit and she doesn't know Definitely what Definitely not. Doing. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just mention about the Edna Pearson story? Because that was a disaster, so it does fit. People get confused about, you know, the, the problem with the Edna Pearson story. And I have conceded before that somehow, I don't know how it didn't click, it didn't click with me. Emily Perry, Edna yeah. Pearson, of course they are the same. Yeah. For some reason, I remembered reading the story about a woman who'd been tried because she'd been slowly poisoning her husband. But when you have no research facilities at all, we didn't have time to go to the library and say what... You would have just had a newspaper, is that right? Pardon? You would have just had a, like a, a daily newspaper. I mean, back then the Herald, the Herald came we out. We got like, the newspapers yeah. delivered every day. Yeah. The newspapers came to the office. The Age came to the office, I think it was, and the Herald's Sun, whatever the papers were, they came. I yeah. think there was the Telegraph back then as well. I don't know. Telegraph and the, and the Herald, before it became the Herald's Sun, was a... It was the Herald, that's right. morning and... Afternoon. And afternoon. Yes. And the papers came to the office. We only had time to scan the headlines. Yep. And if the headline sounded like a good story, I'd make a note of it and it would become a future story. The problem was not that we told the Emily Perry story, even though it was what they call sub judice. She had been charged. So yeah. technically, you weren't allowed to. Um, discuss it in any way shape or form but because she had a different name that was okay however the problem with the edna pearson story is that in my version of the story i openly said she was guilty by having her trying to kill cass and what they claimed was that, and rightly so, and what they claimed was that that could have had an influence on any jury that could have been detrimental to her defence. Even though she wasn't in jail and didn't do the poisoning of Cass, we, I broke the law. Effectively, I broke the law. Grundy's had to pay out a sum. I have no idea what it was, but you can imagine how pissed off they were with me. And I should have been more careful. I wasn't. I totally take the blame for it, but it was not intentional. So those are two cases of stories which were disasters. The first one because they just did not believe that the audience would accept um, a transsexual character. They, they just thought that, and they also thought that the character was boring they, they had wanted her to, if we had kept her, they said, well, why not have somebody really flamboyant and crazy and over the top, et cetera, et cetera. And this story, uh, the only way I can pinpoint it in time is that it did precede Gay Ray, the cook, because I then said, well, if you want a flamboyant gay character, let us let me write one and i wrote gay ray the cook unfortunately the actor that was cast 
was a very fine heterosexual actor called Annex Minglet. I think it's Minglet. Um, yeah. um, uh, yeah. <laughs> who was not in any way, shape or form an outrageous gay character. And so the character was another disaster. But do you think, do you think a character needs to be gay to play a, do you think a, Pardon? A, do you think a character needs to be gay to play a gay character? No, I don't. I, it's called acting. acting yeah. It's yeah. called acting. There is a move now that only gay people should play gay characters. They should have a chance to play them, but in the long run, the best actor should get the role. Right. Now, Alex Menglet is a fantastic actor. He was the wrong actor for that role. He, but because it was not a major role, have it been a major role like Reb or somebody like that, I would have seen the auditions, but I didn't. The first time he popped up on screen, I went, what the? I couldn't believe it. I just, I just couldn't believe it. So there's, I'm, I'm counting my own disasters and missed Too opportunities. Too many of them, though. Yeah. Um, I've, can we do some home? I've got a few comments from people from previous episodes that just want to. Okay. Things is that. A, I, I know you don't like things being thrown at you, but there is just a few. Um, before we get into it. So Diesel Gav said on the YouTube channel, Blue Healers is great. We only got the first seven series in the UK Midlands area on ITV. When ITV refor reformatted as one company, it was dropped, which was such a shame. So I bought them all on DVD off eBay. And Coral's episodes are definitely the best. We get character development and a heartbreaking character exit in Coral's episodes. So good. Um, so that's more what's the question? There's no question, that's just no. a wrap for me. You shouldn't just be reading rap. raps for me. Now we're starting off. Um, Kiev7385 is the username. Enjoy the background information about prisoner, the ins and outs are fascinating. I found Blue Healers via this podcast. I have reached season six, and many episodes now list Coral Druin in the credits. My question is, what is the difference between story editor and story producer? Okay. I see Coral Druin listed as one or the other. Thank you for your excellent series of The Soapbox. Regards, Stephen O'Neill, expat from America. Okay, well, you obviously Man. haven't looked at your own page because I answered it on the page. Or this maybe... is on YouTube. Uh, oh, okay, but he put yep. the same question on the page. Okay. Here is... here. Here is the hierarchy of the creative department, okay? Now, this is apart from administration and apart from um, production, <laughs> right? So in administration, you've got your producers. In production, you've got your casting directors, your location scouts, your, um, um, did I say directors? Your directors, um in the creative department, what is called the creative department, here is the hierarchy. And top of the department has one of several names. The names have changed over the years as the head, as, as people within television have realized that if the creative department doesn't work, nothing else works. You can't do anything with a show if the creative department doesn't work. So at the head, you have got, and it's called by several names, either what it's called now is the showrunner. The showrunner virtually runs the show, chooses the writers, comes up with the stories, holds all the meetings, and then delivers the packet, is involved in the casting, chooses the director for an episode, etc., and then presents the package to both the admin and production arms of the company, right? Yep. The showrunner has enormous power. In fact, the showrunner now has the most power of anybody involved in a production. Not more power than the network executives or the people who buy the shows, but more power than anybody else. Now, that role 
does still not exist within Australia as a title. It exists as a title in America, and I believe it's now coming in in England, but it doesn't exist in Australia. What exists in its place in Australia in chron chronological terms, so up until, say, uh, well, up until now, basically, is the person who runs that department is called the script producer or the story producer. One of those two titles. Same job, different title, right? They do all the things that the showrunner would do, but they don't have the same kind of autonomy. They still are treated somewhat as underlings, on a par with the others, but they don't have the final say. Under that, going back to the 80s and 90s, that role was called the story editor. Now, that's different to a script editor. The script editor takes the script once it is written, yep. once it exists, and then makes changes to make sure that it tracks from the previous episode and nobody says something stupid which screws up another story. The story editor does what the script producer, story producer, showrunner does. They create the stories, create the characters, liaise with the act, with the uh, writers, tell the writers what it's about, what has to be pushed, what has to be, um, you know, what can be laid back because it's not that important. Within every episode, we have several what we call TCs. TC stands for tentative cut. So you have scenes that you put in there which you can pull the entire scene out and not shoot it even if you know you're going to run over without it affecting the story. So the editors don't, the film editors don't have to go in to editing and say, well, I don't know what to cut because there's important information in every scene. So you factor that in and, and the script or story producer will say to the writer, that is a tentative cut. So don't put anything in it that we can't afford to lose. Now, that is separate to the writer. In the case of Blue Healers, the writer was always in the room and I talked to the writer. I always had storyliners working with me to help with the stories. Uh, not so much to come up with them, although some some storyliners do come up with, uh, with ideas. Um, it was one of my storyliners on Prisoner that came up with the men in prison. He'd read about it happening in America and said, could we do that? And first of all, I said, no. And then I said, well, hang on. Yeah, maybe we could. But Is still a job now, a storyliner? They still have storyliners? or They still have storyliners. Yeah, oh. they do. On certain shows, they still have storyliners. They have storyliners on Neighbours. They have storyliners on Home and Away. They still have storyliners. It's pretty much an entry-level job. So if you want to be a writer, you generally start as a storyliner. Now, what Stephen is talking about is he would see, and for all of season seven, he would have seen at the beginning of every episode, I, I don't think my credit on Blue Healers was script producer. I think it had moved to be story producer, even though I did what we call the final edit on the final pass on the scripts. So they came to me, they started with me, they went around the circle through the writers, through the editors and came back to me. And then I said, no, I would go through it and say, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. And I would make the final changes, which I, I think I did on a Friday morning. And then over the weekend, they would go out to the actors. And then at the beginning of the following week, we would have the first read with the actors and I would always be there and so I could make changes. So he would see my name up front amongst the credits where it says producer and it would say story producer Coral Druid. But if I wrote an episode, it would simply say writer. Yep. So I would get two credits right. on the one 
episode. So it, it isn't an either or. It was always story producer. But if I wrote an episode, as with Maggie Doyle's death and, and a few others, <clears throat> although some of them, if there are Blue Heelers right, watchers out there, if you come across any episodes written by Grace Pilkington, that's me under a pseudonym. Oh, really? That's that's what happens when a script comes in which is unworkable because it's just not well enough written. And there are quite a few of those. And we can't put that script out because it's not good enough. However, we cannot credit another real writer because sufficient of the original writer's script is in there that it would cause a conflict of interest. Who gets paid? Who gets the credit? Wow. So you, you put the script out under a fake name, someone who does not exist. So if you come across, um, and I think I used it on a couple of other shows, but if you come across a script written by Grace Pilkington, um, and the English people will know that Pilkington's Glass was the biggest glass manufacturer in England. And that's where I took the name from because my oh, uncle yeah. used to work for Pil Pil Pilkington ah. Glass. Um, so if you come across the script by Grace Pilkington, it's actually yeah. Coral Druin. But a lot of fake okay. names on this podcast. <laughs> But hopefully that sorts out the... I, I do understand it's confusing because people think there was a question about a script written by, oh, Kit Oldfield shaped the story on such and such. No, he didn't. He wrote the script. Um, I wish I had. I do have on my computer some home and away scene breakdowns. So what I might do is when I get back from the cruise, Matt, because the format is the same, I might print one out just to show people what gets given to the writers. It'd be amazing. Because we say it's join the dots. We say if you've ever done those puzzles when you were young where you have to join the dots, dots and, and yeah. oh, wow, it's a bird. <laughs> or, oh, it's a panda. I didn't know what it was. That's what we call join the dots writing. When you get given the storyline and you just have to make sure that you hit every one of the points Honestly. in the storyline. So um, that's why they get a scene breakdown. breakdown. So they yeah. don't create the story. They join the dots and write the dialogue, etc. In fact, still in Europe, and even up until very recently, I don't know if they still do it, in um, New Zealand on Shortland Street, the actual writer gets credited as dialogue writer. Oh, because okay. someone else has done everything else and all they do is write the dialogue. dialogue. Wow. And isn't this amazing that some fans never heard of Blue Healers have now discovered it via this podcast it's it's i look i think that there is a there's actually a question not a question but a very very nice comment on the talking prisoner page um about home and away about angie russell i saw that yes now, Angie Russell is a character I created for Blue Healers. She's probably the most insidious villain I've ever created. And in fact, there was a poll in England some years back, not that long ago, well, not that long ago, maybe 10 years, but which Wait said who, yes, who was the worst villain ever on television worst in in terms of the most evil person ever on television in a soap and angie russell won and that was partly due to the way laurie folds played her and but largely due to me creating her the way she was and i'm not sure if i've ever told you this but i imagine that angie russell in home and away was angel from angel. prisoner yes you grown did. Up. yes you did and that, that character was inspired by a character in a film called the bad seed from the 19, might have been the early 1960s, but I have a feeling it was the late 1950s, which was a kid that appeared, you know, harmless, just really 
terrific on the surface, but was evil to the core. And what I love to do, as you would know, is I like to bring up moral dilemmas. Is she really evil or is it just the way she's been brought up? Nature versus uh, nurture and all those things. And I'm very proud of Angie Russell and I thank the person who thanked me for that character because she, whoa, boy, she was yeah. evil. And then, and, and speaking she, of darkness, um, I know we've covered this, but we do have a lot of new fans joining every week. And yes, I know, I know, yeah. Um, so some people don't know, but Ryan Ryan Foster said from uh, the arrival of Bev Baker to Sam Greenway murder, this was the darkest period of Prisoner. Uh, Meg's rape, the arrival of Bev and Angel close together. We do know why, um, but do you want to? I know we've got to move on with what we're doing, but um, it's all right. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> look, I was in a dark place. I had, I could foresee, and I think we were into the early five hundreds by then. I could foresee that the show could not keep going, and I wanted to do a series of telly movies. I wanted the show to wind up and be replaced by a series of telemovies where we had a chance to tell each character's full story. And I got knocked back because they was they were just starting to sell the series overseas and they said, we, you know, we can't do that. I was also going through a very bad period in my life in that it, I had a 15-year-old daughter Anyone who's had a 15-year-old daughter knows you've got it to come, Matt. Believe me, you Please, still have it to come. Um, it's very, very difficult. It was extremely difficult. And in fact, if you remember the scared straight story that we did, putting the three girls in prison, one of those girls was my daughter, Liza Birmingham, played one of the girls, and I had hoped that the scared straight story might indeed have an effect on her. Unfortunately, it didn't. And um, fantastically smart, bright, um, charming when she wants to be, beautiful, beautiful woman, um, but a difficult child. And I did not... I fully concede I was a lousy mother to her. I had no idea how to handle her, what to do. And I was in a very, very dark place. I also had a partner who was bipolar. Now, if anyone out there has dealt with mental illnesses, they will know what that means and how difficult that is to live with. Um, so I was in a dark place. And much as we like to say that we are detached from the stories and the characters we write, creatives cannot be because nothing that we do comes from outside. An idea might come from outside, but evolving it into a story and creating the characters to carry that idea all comes from inside. It is absolutely impossible to be a creative and create good stories. You can be a journeyman and just say, oh, well, let's rehash something from there. But it comes from inside. And I, inside, I was in a very bad place. I would come to work and go straight to the toilet and sit on the toilet and cry for half an hour at the start of every day. Why didn't I just throw it in? Money. Right. Most of what we do in life is governed by money. Right. I think by that stage, and this is the 1980s we're talking about, I was earning about $1,500 a week. Your door just opened. Pardon? The door just oh, like the cat the... just came in. The cat oh. just—it's not a ghost. It's not a story. The ghost it's, prisoner. it's one of the, it's one of the cats coming in. I could not walk away from the money. I had a, a partner who was mentally ill, couldn't earn anything. Um, for those of you interested, in a very very early episode, where um, the women do a concert at the men's prison. Yep. 
And Jane Clifton, who played Margot Gaffney, um, sang, I think it was Midnight Special or something like that. That was my partner, Tony Druin, on guitar with her, really? disguised as a prisoner in oh, the wow. men's prison. That that was him, a brilliant, brilliant guitarist, seriously mentally ill, died a horrible death back in 2016, went into a diabetic coma, uh, was hearing voices, was schizophrenic, wouldn't call for a doctor or an ambulance, oh. and lay dead on the floor in a Queensland summer for 10 days before oh. paramedics found what they call the soup which is what he had been reduced to by lying there dead all that time. So that's why the show got dark. Also, there was a push to have more comedy in the show. And I personally, we'd had a lot of comedy. One of the, one of the things that Prisoner did, which most dramas now do, is they balance the light and shade. But back in the day, you didn't get comedy in dramatic shows. You didn't get, you know, in Division 4 or Matlock Police, you did not get funny stories or funny characters. It was dark. Yeah. And we had a lot of comedy, including black comedy, in <laughs> Prisoner. And I had reached a stage where I thought, I can't find anything funny anymore about people being stuck in prison. There was a spate of uh, wrongful imprisonments and uh, um, people being released from jails who shouldn't have been there. And, and I just saw nothing funny in it anymore. And I should have left then. I didn't have the guts to leave then. So, you know, I should have left of my own accord instead of waiting to be pushed. But for all those who note that the show is dark, was dark during that period, Why? you're absolutely right. And it's entirely due to where I was at. However, having said that, the show got more critical acclaim when it was dark. Yeah. Because the critics and the newspapers said, at last Prisoner is taking the incarceration of women seriously and doing some serious stories instead of just froth and bubble and putting on a pantomime or something like that. Yeah. So if you please the audience, you don't please the critics. If you please the critics, That's you it. don't please the audience. In the long run, I guess the answer is you please yourself. That's it. Now, one other comment I'll just quickly mention. It's just a comment which I thought was very interesting. Um, Camp Galore is the username on YouTube. Another terrific show. Coming from the UK, I'd never seen Maury Fields in anything before. So I thought he was brilliant as Len Murphy. I never drew a comparison with Jock Stewart. To me, they were completely different. The Thank show you. The showdown between Len and the freak was really well done where he calls her a bastard was a very interesting choice of insult. Um, so it was interesting to know that someone in the UK didn't it's know Maury totally Field, never knew that he was a comedian, never exactly. knew that part of him. So there was no way, Matt, for us to know that that would be the reaction. Correct. In, yeah. in retrospect, of course, you, you have to remember, and I, I know I say this often, but I can't hammer it enough. We had no idea that the show would take off overseas. overseas yeah. We never thought for one minute that anyone outside of Australia would see that show. And you have to remember that it was one of the first shows produced that made it worldwide. It preceded Neighbours. I don't know whether it preceded Neighbours on air in the UK, but it preceded Neighbours in terms of production. How do I know that? Because I wrote episodes 16 to 20, 16 to 20 of Neighbours yeah. while I was doing episodes 300 and something of Prisoner. Yeah. We did not know. We had no idea that it would be far reaching. The idea that people are still watching these podcasts are still involved in the show 
who still say, oh, you know, send me messages. When are you coming to England? When are yeah, we going to see you there? Which Matt and I have discussed and we hope to do oh, down the track. But but we couldn't have foreseen that back in 1980. <laughs> We didn't have the slightest idea. I mean, I remember we had a question a few uh, soapboxes back about, oh, you dropped the ball, you didn't cover AIDS. Well, you guys started watching the show in 84 or 85. We were making it in 1980-odd. There wasn't any AIDS. Yeah. There were something like 300 cases in the whole of Australia. There wasn't enough to think that it was ever going to be important. So it wasn't that we dropped the ball or we missed the chance or that was a missed opportunity. It wasn't a missed opportunity because it didn't, the opportunity didn't exist. And speaking of AIDS, I'm just actually reading a book on the history of nightclubs in New York between, I think it was 1978 and 84, this historian. And geez, the amount of people that, were scared to go to nightclubs that they all lost their friends due to AIDS. It just I lost I lost I lost a heap of friends. I had so many gay friends and and I lost several straight friends as well to AIDS. Um it was a terrifying thing, mm -hmm. but it was post 1985. By the time it was an epidemic worldwide Literally. and in Australia we had ceased production, so there was never a chance yeah. to do it. All right. Storylines that didn't... Now, let's get on to the Barnhurst Five. No, I'm joking. Um... <laughs> I was just going to say thank you, and that's our podcast for today. That's... Can I start with one while I yes. remember it? Please. There is. There was a question about Cookie. Yep. Now, when B was doing outside work in the print shop, Cookie was a character there. Cookie could have been a major, major, major character. And I know someone said there was a missed opportunity. She was, you know, poorly used and didn't have the story. And she found out about her husband and left him and took her daughter. And that was it. We never saw her again. Two things. I cannot stress enough that much as you might want people, actresses, to stay in roles, the choice is either theirs or the producers. The person playing the character of Cookie was an actress called Judy Kennelly, who is a gay icon here in Australia and who is a big star of stage and cabaret here in Australia. And there was no way that Judy Kennelly was going to stay on for years and years and years. Secondly, we had a storyline which at the time was hugely contentious. It's, it's really interesting that um, a new person came into Grundy's around this time, and that person was the famous Bevan Lee. Bevan Lee is responsible for a lot of shows that you may have seen streaming, like A Place Called Home, Packed to the Rafters, um, stuff like that. What? Um, All Saints. Now, Bevan Lee is openly gay, but had a belief at the time that the audience did not want to be confronted by certain subjects. Later on, when I went into Home and Away, he did not want me to have a gay character in there because it was a turn off for the audience. The backstory or the actual story of Cookie was that Cookie found out that her husband had been sexually abusing, continually raping their teenage daughter. If we could have kept Cookie, if we could have kept Cookie. And this is where I'm opening up the lost opportunities, if you like. Yeah. If we could have kept Cookie, she would have been a great friend to be. <clears throat> she would not have wanted to be top dog. 
she because she liked B and she would have accepted B was top dog. However, if anything happened to B, she would come after the person who did anything to B and she would seek retribution. She would be in prison for killing that husband. She would have killed him. She would not have got miffed and said, oh, you've been raping her, so I'm not going to be married to you anymore. I'm taking her and I'm pissing off. She would have killed him. She would have taken a knife and gutted him. Yeah. And she would have been so anti-incest and child abuse. She would have dealt with Ruth Ballinger. There would have been a huge set to with Ruth Ballinger. She would have, when she found out about um, Joan virtually adopting a child, she would have gone Joan. She would have attacked Joan. She would have had as a defense that her mission in life was to rid the world of pedophilia, not just incest, but pedophilia. She had about four episodes inside. Maybe a few more, I don't know, I'm sure. Someone will tell me how many episodes she had. But however many it is, it wasn't how many she could have had. I would have kept her in a heartbeat. The powers that be said, <gasps> <clears throat> excuse me that's not our show we can't do that we can't talk about pedophilia we can't talk about incest and I you know I said but there's serious subjects for which people go to prison hopefully some of you can see that although I will as I've said many times before I consider that show my child it was a different show after Denise left it. Many prefer Denise's version. I have no problem with that. It was a different show. The deal was, yes, I will come in. I will take over the story department, but I tell my stories my way. I don't want to do it somebody else's way. I did not want to be... Um, Denise Morgan was a superb writer and she knew the characters she'd created, but they weren't my children. So I wanted to create new characters, naturally. Every story editor does it. And I wanted to create new characters. I wanted to tackle new themes. But if ever there was a wasted opportunity, it was Cookie. It was Cookie could have been... We could be sitting here week after week talking about what Cookie did yeah. if she could have stayed. Yeah. But they just would not tackle, would not confront the incest situation. Oh, wow. I wanted to go as far as, because I know this does happen, um, story producers and script producers do a lot of psychological work. They do a lot of work on the psychology of why characters do what they do. And I knew that in a lot of cases of incest, the kids blame themselves and they still love their father. Yeah. They still adore their father. I wanted with the cookie story for her to have killed um, for Cookie to have killed her husband and for her daughter, sorry, can't remember the name, I'm old, um, for her daughter to have turned against her so that when she came to the visits and her mother tried to touch her or hold her or hug her, she would pull back and say, you murdered my dad, you killed my dad, how could you do that? And Judy Kennelly could have played the ass off that role she could have been absolutely brilliant it could have been one of the major major characters in prisoner why wasn't it because the powers that be said we can't tackle questions like that we can't do incest it's too contentious and in some ways they were they were right if you remember the um the Joan and Terry Malone story, yep. the idea of having Joan fall in love with another woman, that made, there was a magazine, there was a paper called Truth at the oh, time. Oh, Truth, yes. In Melbourne. 
I made the front page. Of the truth. Of the truth. Centerfold. The story <laughs> made, no, the story made the front page really? of the truth. Wow. Because we were showing a lesbian relationship. And then again, when I did Arcade, I tried to do another lesbian relationship. Wow. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, I grew up in show business surrounded by gay people. Yeah, of course. They weren't any different to anybody else as far as I was concerned. They were just people. Yeah. Okay, why were people picking on them? Because they were gay. What's gay? Oh, because they love the same sex. So what? Mm. Who gives a shit? I didn't give a shit. I didn't care. Everybody was so uptight about, oh, yeah. And I said, it's not as if Joan Ferguson is a hero. She's our baddie. What if she falls in love with a woman who is manipulating her? Why can't we do that? Oh, because a straight person wouldn't do that to a gay person. Bullshit. Yeah. Happens all the time. And I'm sure there will be gay fans who will post, yes, I know of a case where a straight person manipulated a gay person. Gay person. But that was why we didn't see Cookie. Okay. People say, oh, you know, you, you dropped the ball. You missed the opportunity. You think we didn't see the opportunities? Of course we saw the opportunities. Definitely. But if Wasn't, we are forbidden sorry. to tell those stories, what are you going to do? Quit? I mean, I quit three times on that show, and each time they asked me to come back, and each time I asked for a little bit more leeway, a little bit more power, not because I wanted the power, but because I wanted to tell stories that they didn't want to tell. Yeah. And... We missed a giant opportunity with the Cookie character. Judy Canelli would have been bigger than Val Lehman, I hate to say it, but she would have been, that character would have been the major character in the show. Wow. So, yes, I recognise it was a missed opportunity, absolutely. But now, that was the producers. Now, you said before either the powers that be want the person gone or the actress wants to leave. Now, the next yeah. one, we know why this was a missed opportunity. Nell Johnson, who played Sarah Higgins, who I absolutely love. Um, Nell's going to be at the event as well. I've met Nell when we did our interview with her. She's absolutely brilliant. There were, there were countless opportunities with um, the Sarah Higgins character because she knew the law. So because she knew the law, she knew how to bend it. She knew how to get round it. She knew how to create alibis, defences, etc. She would have been a very, very useful character to keep around. Why didn't we keep her around? Did we miss opportunities? No, we didn't. She simply wanted to leave. Yeah. Sure. And you can't hold a gun to someone's head and say you have to stay. A lot of people are terrified of being typecast. If she would they have liked to have stayed, them. though. She did mention that. She would have liked to have stayed, but she had this movie. Uh, she she had, had a movie to do. She was committed to it. Yeah. She didn't have a choice. She was committed to it. And because she was committed to it, she was under contract to something, something else. I think the same is true of Hannah Ruby, who played um, awesome. um, Paddy Lawson. But who's, just to go back one minute, whose idea was it to turn her from VJ into the inmate? Because, I mean... She'd been in four or five times as a, as a visiting justice, Sarah Higgins. and then... Because she was a good actress. Yeah. Because I saw, bloody hell, she's good. Yeah. But all we can do if she stays outside is have her keep popping up doing the same thing. You. If you want to use an actress more, then you have to, you have to acknowledge how that character's been set up and what her backstory is. That was but brilliant. you have to then look oh. into the future and say, how do we spin that character around? And the only way to do it was to put her in prison. If we had put her in prison, I can tell you now, she would have been the one who set up the tribunal and had the kangaroo court and heard everybody's, you know, put people on trial within the prison. Yeah. 
She would have done that. We would have done that with that character. So again, missed opportunities, but not because we openly missed them. We saw the opportunities. We just did not have the chance to use them because of circumstances. In the case of Hannah Ruby, from memory, she was another one who left because she had another job. Um, and from memory, it was the time when we had to write Paddy Lawson out because she was going into a country practice, which was another huge show. Um, and if you get a chance to be part of a show like that on a regular basis, you take it. And so when her, I think it was, maybe she was only on a six week or 13 week contract. We had different contracts. We had four weeks, six weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks and 26 weeks with options. So it would depend on what kind of contract people were signed to. We lost Lisa Crittenden. We could have gone anywhere with Maxine Daniels. If we had kept Maxine, we wouldn't have needed Bobby. We wouldn't have needed Rabbit. We maybe wouldn't have needed even Reb, hate to say it. Um, because she would have gone through the system and been changed by the system. And Lisa Crittenden was so good and had such appeal. Yeah. I mean, I think she just lights up the screen whenever she's on. And we wouldn't have needed those other characters if we could have kept her. But she wanted to leave. I remember talking to Smithy. and this yeah, is He was actually in a car trying to get her back. He, he spoke about the story. Um, Lisa did as well, saying that you know, she was in the car with him and he was asking her to come back. Well, I said to him, you've got to get her to sit. That started with me saying, excuse me, I'm sitting on a cushion to be high enough for the camera. And it just slipped from under my bum. And for anything to slip from under my bum, it has to be fairly strong. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I went to him and said, Smithy, you've got to get her to stay. You've, you've got it. We've got stories planned. And we did. We had a whole heap of stories in the pipeline for her. And I said, you know, you have to get her to stay. And Smithy took her aside. I didn't realize it was in the car, but I yeah. knew he took told the to story her. on the on the podcast. I can't remember exactly why they're in the car together, but yeah, he she mentioned it. Well, he came back, and I I remember him walking into the room, and I looked up and I nodded my head, and he went, <laughs> "She's absolutely determined." Now, um, and I said. Why don't they give her more money? Can we give her more money? And, you know, they were notoriously... Well, it's not that they were notoriously penny-pinching. The reality was they didn't have the money to give her. So, you know, it was on such a tight budget. They never made a profit from that show until it sold overseas. Yeah, wow. So, you know, why didn't they... Why didn't the money give... Mm. Why didn't they give the extra money to Anne Phelan and then we wouldn't have had her leave? And it, there was no more money. Expensive helicopter. There was no more money in the coffers. They could not do it. The bullshit about the helicopter and it cost more than that than it would have cost to give her. No, it wouldn't. Yeah. Annie was asking for, I think it was $600 a week more. If you multiply that by 45 weeks of a year, you get a lot more money than... My understanding is it was still the Channel 10 helicopter, but even if it wasn't, even if they hired a helicopter for a day, that's a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah. That is not what it would have cost to have kept Anne Phelan. There wasn't any more money. Next. 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 Um, Jeff Carson. So he was the deputy governor at Woodridge when the... Uh, the in Danny Adcock, right? Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I, I don't know how you would have got him, how the storyline would have had him go to Wentworth to be an officer because he's a deputy governor. Why would he, you know, give up the deputy governorship? But I thought he was a great, great character. Look, um, the worry with Danny Adcock, and I, I know somebody mentioned Arcade in there who I would have known from Arcade. Um, 
I can't remember if I did arcade before or after Prisoner. I think it must have been before. So I did know Danny, and Danny's a really good actor. But to me, we would have been repeating the Fletch story. Yeah. We would have been repeating the Fletcher story. He was a very good actor, but the way the character had been set up, because it wasn't meant to be an a lasting character i felt that people would say oh here we go they're repeating fletcher again yeah. and even though we had the appeal of um gerard Maguire, Maguire to women to such an extent that he got the nickname fletch the lech um i could see that we would go down the same road with Danny, if we had never had Fletch, then it would have been great. And there would have been no reason why he couldn't have been disciplined for some reason and had the governorship taken away from him. And his reason for coming to Wentworth is he would simply have said, I couldn't stay there and just be one of the one of the wardens when I had been their boss, when I had been on above them and so we would have understood hello he has a little bit of an authority complex we can use that uh, but I, it just wasn't at the right time and and incidentally can i can i say to that that there is the sometimes you have to actually change direction in mid course sometimes you do not have the benefit of thinking it through and saying okay well it, it'll take four weeks or so but once we get over that hurdle we can do this sometimes in fact most times we had to make snap decisions as i say for people who have grown up with computers with being able to research google anything in two minutes type it on a keyboard erase it even set up voice type you can have no possible idea what it was like working on a golf ball typewriter yeah. to get a golf ball typewriter to erase anything you had to actually click it onto the golf ball and then go over the letters that you'd done wrong by by typing the same letters again and it would lift with the white tape wow. it would lift the letters off the page and then you could take the the correct word do you have any idea if you had to retype a sentence how long that took not seconds like it does now on a computer but minutes minutes and minutes and minutes what and if it process? was too do you much handwrite on a, do you handwrite on a notepad first and then go to type or you straight from the didn't have time to do to handwrite on a notepad and then type did not have time to do that there was you know there, we tried for a minute to have a typist who was really quick, et cetera, and say, you know, maybe this will make it easier for us. Do you realize that if you do that, you have to put in all the punctuation yourself? Wow. You have to say, um, Ted Douglas knocks on the door, full stop, capital letter. He enters, full stop, oh, comma, Erica is seated at her desk dash yeah. he approaches can you imagine all creativity goes out of the window it do. just it can't be done it can be done now because we have computers it could not be done then the wonder is not that the show has survived 45 years the wonder is that the show ever happened in the first place in the schedule that we had, no other one hour, which is 45 minute show, no other one hour show was produced twice weekly 
which is, which comes down to an hour and a half or an hour 40 minutes of content, which in those days was the length of the average film. It was equivalent to making a feature film yeah. every single week. Couldn't Or two weeks if you count that we did the OB in the week preceding the studio. Yeah. Can you imagine anyone saying, oh, yeah, I make a feature film every two weeks? Couldn't happen. It was a miracle. We all said it couldn't happen then. And then, of course, when we discovered that it could, it was a matter of pride to make it happen and make it as good as we could. How do you but say that? Because no. a producer friend of mine in the States who worked on The Sopranos, there we go, I've mentioned The Sopranos again. Yeah. He couldn't. Be he can't believe it because he, he he likes the show now. Um, he goes, how did they do it? twice a week like that well like how we did it was we worked 14 hour days we worked 14 hour days there were there were so many things and part of the my problem with my youngest daughter where i was such a ratchet mother to her whereas i had been a good mother to the my eldest daughter the difference was prisoner with my eldest daughter at the same age, I was not working 14 hour days. I missed sports days. I missed school concerts. I missed special outings. I was not available. Yeah. I missed hearing how she had gone at school. I missed dealing with any problems in her life. I was not available. I adopted that show as a child and that's why I am so fiercely defensive of it and why I get pissed off when people say, oh, why didn't you do such and such? You're saying that now 40 years later. Try putting yourself back to 1980 to 1985 and see how you would have managed. You wouldn't have lasted. Those people that week after week, soapbox after soapbox, throw shit at you and I, would not have lasted one single solitary day what have they ever done with their lives when they have all these things at their fingertips let alone when they didn't have anything at their fingertips i'm enormously proud of every single one of my writers even the ones who didn't make the grade i'm enormously proud of every single one of those people in the story department you know the the chance i had to kickstart careers for writers kit was kit was working in um production trying to do locations when i said to him you don't belong there mate come over to the story department and i'll train you as a storyliner um i'm enormously proud of what we did in there and you know this is why and i don't say this it is said about me and it is rem my daughter Kelly reminds me of this. It is why people say Coral Druin is a legend. I don't know how I did it. I just know I did. We, were, we weren't given a choice. It was either do it and work 15 hours a day and make it something that people wanted to watch or have it be a total crock of shit you have to remember when i was brought in house much as people love and adore the denise morgan ian bradley first year and a half or whatever it was that show was due to be cancelled i was brought in and i was asked could you give the show another 13 weeks? That's all they asked of me. Could you come up? We're out of stories. We're out of characters. We don't know what we're going to do. Could you give it another 13 weeks? And it lasted for another five and a bit years. So I don't know how I did it. I, I have no idea. So I can't say, oh, well, I'm a freaking genius. That's how I did it. I don't know how I did it. I look back now and I say exactly what your friend, the producer of The Sopranos says. Ow. How do we do it? <laughs> how in God's name did we make a show which 45 years later people are still talking about and listening to podcasts about it 
with a minuscule budget and with the equivalent of a feature film every two weeks. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, some of the storyliners were so burnt out, they got out of television and never worked in it again. Some oh. of the writers were so burnt out, they never worked again. When I went through my black period that people talk about, the show got so dark, I was burning out. I didn't know I was burning out, but I was burning out. In fact, despite the fact that I was fired from the show for taking the blame for something that I didn't do, and we have talked about this before as oh, well, yes. I, I think Kid Oldfield said to me, you engineered your own firing. And it's true. I couldn't walk away from the show. There was no way I could quit. I could not ever have quitted. It would have like it would have been like saying to one of my kids, oh, well, you're on your own now. I don't give a stuff. And so the only way to get out of it, not consciously, I didn't do it consciously. My God, I spent two years grieving over that show after I left it and watching it, you know, go down the tube, um, even though they pulled it back, apparently, in the last six months. Channel 10 had already said, nah, it's not the same, and it cancelled it. So, you know, even though people rang me up and said, there you are, you see, you're vindicated. Grundy's got what's coming to them. The show's been cancelled. I felt no joy in that. But if I had not subconsciously engineered my firing, I think it would have killed me. I think I would have had a brain aneurysm or um, I would have had a stroke. I was very, very overweight in those days, far more so than I am now. I mean, I, I carry a bit of extra weight now, but I was, you know, like 15, 16 stone or, you know, 115, 120 kilograms in those days. I would have either had a stroke or I would have had a heart attack, or I would just have died from sheer overwork. But I believed in it, and I believed that we had things to say. And I'm really sorry about the things that we didn't get to say, but it's still a freaking miracle. It's a miracle, Matt. It's just... Yeah. And so I am rightfully, I believe, enormously proud of it, and even though there are people who say, oh, it's the first two years was the best. And there are people who say, oh, yeah, but they repeated storylines. Well, again, you have to remember, we couldn't look up what storylines had already been done. There was no Bible in the... You know, in you know about the first, you said about the first two years and everything like that. I, I find with Prisoner, I, I go through stages myself where I'm like, I can watch the first two years and go, oh, God, I, I, I love the first two years. And then I can watch the next two years and go, oh, I prefer that over the first two years. I, I, I go through, you go through stages with this show. It's, it's. Look, it's... the first two years had this going for it. No one had ever seen anything like it before. No one had ever seen grungy looking women. I mean, within these walls, which the show was snitched from um they weren't grungy looking women they were ah. all nicely made up and they were all very nice so no one had ever seen it anything like it visually before and no one had ever seen... the officers to that show within these walls that was more the officers lives than it was rather than the prisoners no one had ever seen a character like and these this is nothing to do with me this is all power to Denise Morgan, Ian Bradley, and a little bit of Reg Watson. No one had ever seen a lesbian smash up a room like Frankie Doyle did. And so that first couple of years, when you look back on it now, you can see, oh, yeah, the walls wobbled, because that's when people discovered that the walls wobbled, and, oh, yeah, well, that wouldn't have happened. But it was so fresh and so new that that is why people love those first two years so much. God, I would have loved... I saw the very first episode, and, and I said, I want to do that. I want to write that show. Holy shit, what is it? I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to last. 
when I found out it was only going to be 16 weeks and Denise was going to write as many of them as possible, I thought, no, I won't get a chance. So when they said, can you come in and give it another three to six months, I thought all my Christmases had come at once. I would have done it for nothing. I once said to Bev and Lee, I would do this show for nothing. I love it so much. But when I came in, it did get deeper. It did get more complex, largely because that's what I wanted to do. I'm a deep, complex thinker. I, I, I was shit writing Neighbours. Absolute shit writing Neighbours. Because Neighbours was, back at the time when it started, light, frothy, you know, earlier time slot. We don't want to think too much about anything. And I can't do that. You know, I'm I'm not that person. So I was, you know, I remember Rick Mayle, who was a, a writer who also wrote for Prisoner. He was on my writers list for Prisoner. But he went in to Channel 10 when Neighbours moved to Channel 10. And he was the head of drama there. And he said to me, this would be a walk in the park for you. Actually, what he said was, this would be a piece of piss for you writing Neighbours, won't it? And I said, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, Rick, because it's about nothing. <laughs> and it was back then. It was about the end. We have a show in, in England. I don't know if it's still running, but if anybody of the English viewers watching this remembers a show called The Archers, it used to be a radio show. I think it was on a quarter to seven at night. And in my childhood, I listened to it religiously. And it and it would it had this song which went dun da dun da dun da dun dun da dun da 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 dun da dun da dun da dun dun da 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 The Archers, an everyday story of country folk. Well, Neighbours was an everyday story of suburban yeah. folk. Yeah. That's all it was. What did you do today? Oh, I burnt the porridge. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great drama, isn't it? I couldn't write it. I kept looking for where are the stakes? Where are the things that matter to people? And I couldn't write it. And now, even though it's been bumped to a secondary channel, and I don't know that it's even shown in England anymore, but heading that is another of my discoveries, and that is Shana Sheev, who at 15 won a Back to the Bay That's writing cool. contest, which I set up. I was doing... Oh, my God, Shane must be in his 30s now. Um, I was script producer for Home and Away, and I set this competition, and I said to him, do you have any desire to be a writer? Because you can write. And Shane and I would meet down at Frankston, and I would buy him coffee, and he would say, oh, I like stories that do this. And I would point out to him why those stories were bad or why those stories weren't true or why those stories could go another way. And Shane came out of it a really good writer, and he's kept... Neighbours should have finished a couple of years ago. It's It's due to Shane that it's still running because he cut his teeth and learned how to tell stories. Still is on the UK might... as well. It's still yeah in, yeah yeah uh, Amazon free or something it's called oh okay okay right well I'm glad it is because he you know he learned his stuff from me as as you know a, a lot of people did uh, back in the day and here I am a, a three thousand year old dinosaur still doing bloody soap boxes. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of other things coming up too. So, oh yeah, we do have other plans. If I live long enough, get moving, Matt. I've got what? Oh. Maybe I'm I'm eighty in October, and I'm flying to Hawaii to have my eightieth birthday in Honolulu. Amazing. But I can't keep going forever. I mean, I know, know, but that's like when you're coming down for the event. We do have a half a day mapped out to. We do to talk our about projects that we're going to do. Yeah, we. I. I would love to do because I know there are so many fans in England, and Matt and I are talking seriously about uh, 
about doing something next year, apart from the fact that it's so easy to hire a car and just go through the channel and end up in Paris watching the Olympics. Yeah. God, well, I want we've to had fans back. reach out that just want to see us, which is really, well, I mean, you, of course, um, more than me. I want to see you too. They yeah, but I mean, we'll, we'll be happy just to sit in a pub and just, just have a function. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because uh, then we would have to pay our... F we have to make enough to pay yeah, our no, fares. We'll do one of them. Yeah, we do. But um, for those who are still waiting for the book, and I know I promised it last Christmas, <clears throat> most of you know my husband became terminally ill. He died on March the 13th. But for many months before that, for probably since this time last year, I was nursing him through those terminal stages and the book just had to be put to the side and once it was put to the side then um it just wasn't picked up again but it will be but let me tell you something to those who are creatives out there i am working with a playwright at the moment who has all the talent in the world, but none of the craft skills. And so I, he's written two plays. They've both been produced by community theatres. He needs to find some craft skills and you'll end up seeing his plays in the West End or in Sydney or whatever. While I was sitting having coffee, I said to him, oh, I've been trying to write a book about death. Um, you know, how people are so terrified of it. And if we if we weren't terrified of it, it would just be a natural part of living and we'd enjoy life more. And there is a film from the 1950s called Soylent Green. So I think it was, um, might have been Edward G. Robinson's last film and I think it might have been Charlton Heston. But the premise of it was that you got an allotted lifespan if you didn't die of something in the meantime. So if you reach, let's say, 75, on the day you reach 75, you had a bloody big party and a piss up with your family. And then they delivered you to the official place where you were painlessly put to sleep and your body was made into food. Death terrifies the absolute fuck out of me. I You've seen it. No, no, I'm, okay. I haven't seen it. I'm going to see it, but I'm just saying death absolutely... This Still terrifies you. Terrifying. If you were born knowing that you had 75 years, wow, 75 years, that's a long time. I better get a move on. I better not waste it. I better do the things I want to do. I better not say, oh, well, maybe tomorrow. I better not walk away from someone who I think I could love. But hey, I've got other plans. I'm going to enjoy every single day of it. And I'm going to have a big party at the end of it. And I'm not going to feel anything. I'm just going to be put to death. We wouldn't be afraid. It's because we are taught from the day we are born. Oh, my God. What if there isn't anything after death? Well, what if there isn't? That's isn't that all the more reason? Well, we go through all this stuff for what? Nothing. We go through this whole life, and at the end, there's, there's nothing. And Kerry That's Packer, Kerry Packer famously nothing. said, you know, he, he had that heart attack and said, someone asked him, a reporter said, what did you see at the other end? And he goes... There's fucking nothing there. Well, there was nothing there because he believed there would be nothing there. What if this whole world is just part of our imagination? You've seen The Truman Show? I, lo I love that movie. Well, what if this is all a creation which isn't real and we're being manipulated in it? What if we can go through every what if in the world, but if we were born knowing that on a given date, if we made it to that day, oh, that's the day I'm going to die. We wouldn't be scared of it. We wouldn't be afraid at all. I don't what, know. Scares, what scares us is we don't know. Oh, don't holy know. shit. We don't know, but we, we go through. It's it's a weird state. I mean, my like my mum passed in two thousand seventeen, and she's buried at the Springvale Cemetery, the the massive one there. I go through stages going there. There's times where I go there, and then there's times where I won't go for months because the place. Well, let me tell you that whatever of her still exists is not there. 
it's somewhere else. I, I it's, know, in a, yeah, it's not there, yeah. It's in a parallel universe or, you know, whatever the fuck. Oh, excuse me. I got through almost the entire show without saying fuck. Because Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> whatever the fuck it is. But, <laughs> but my point is what we fear really is pain. Yeah. Oh, my God, we see someone we love die in terrible pain or they lose their faculties, their mind doesn't work anymore. And that terrifies us. But that's not death. Well, there was an article on Facebook I read yesterday. There's a, a man in New South Wales. I think it was New South Wales. So today he is doing the assisted dying. He's got stage four terminal cancer. And he said, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through that. And he's choosing the right. So today is the day, um, which like just reading it, it, it brings all these different emotions in you. I, I just thought... my, my favorite comedian from the 1950s, 1960s, when I was in my teens and I bought his album so many times over because I kept wearing them out was Bob Newhart. Bob Newhart. And Bob Newhart was absolutely fantastic comedian. He lived to be 94. He died last week. Yeah. And I put a tribute to him on my Facebook page, but I also put a notice to my daughter. Please don't ever let me live long enough to look like that. Because he looked like a skeleton covered in skin. Nobody wants to go like that. And if women have the right to choose what they do over their own body, then everyone should have the right to choose their moment of death. But if the government says you've got to have a you've got to have a driver's license in order to drive, then if we, it would take three probably three generations. But if the government said you've got to have a date of death in order to have a date of birth. What's the two things everybody does in the world? The one thing we have in common is every single solitary person does two things. We're born and we die. Yeah. Those are the only two things yeah. that we can say absolutely every single solitary being does. They're born and they die. Now, we don't fear birth which is often more painful than death is. But we don't know. We, 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 none of us remember being born. We don't remember it. We do not remember it. So if, if built into our memory was, oh, August the, what's today? August the 2nd, 2031 is so the you, day of my death. Have you saying if we had a set date for our death, we would achieve more in life? We would achieve far more in life. We wouldn't leave anything undone. We wouldn't leave anything unsaid. We would make sure that every single day counted. We would say, well, I've only got 75 years to do this, so yeah. can I afford to waste five years or whatever? We would lead better lives and the world would be a that's better a, place. That's a TV we show all... right there. Pardon? That's a TV show right there. Well, I started out to tell you, and I got sidetracked as I do, and of course the haters will say she can't stick to the subject, oh, but th this is the subject. Yeah. Um, I started out to tell you I was talking to this playwright, and I had heard some wonderful stories about people dying in the hospice when Tony died in the hospice. And I thought, I'm going to write a book about this, about positive things. And the book will be written, and the title is Love You to Death. But I also, talking to this guy, said, you know what? There's a play in here. There's a play where the lead character is death, who can't understand why everybody is pissed off or hates him or her, might be a her, can't understand why everyone's afraid, comes to visit, gets treated like a pariah, gets tried, try to push him out the door, and why? I'm as natural as birth. Why are you all so scared of me? And you tell the story of how death visits half a dozen different people. There was a story that was told to me about a young boy with Down syndrome who had an alternative personality as a rapper and a DJ. And um, when his mum died, he 
as himself couldn't say anything, couldn't speak at the funeral or anything. And it was suggested to him that he could do it the other character, let's call him oh, Captain Fantastic, yeah. that the other character could dress, get dressed up and do it, do a rap for her. And that is precisely what he did. He wow. got dressed up as this character with his cape and everything, and he started with his turntable, and he said, Yo, Mum, Mama die, gone to heaven, never see you no more, Mama not coming back. Mama. And he did a full rap, and he worked through his grief, and he said goodbye to his mother as this other character. Now, you could put that in a play, and people would say, Oh my God, that's so amazing. But it would never happen, but it did. Truth is always stranger than fiction. Have we got any more on the missed opportunities, or because we're we are yeah. running? We are. <laughs> we always sorry, do. sorry. Um, that's me. That's me. No, but it is called the soapbox. No, it is no, not the, just about prisoner. This is about everyday life. This, this, it's this. about everything that everything. interests me. And if you don't like it, don't watch. Yeah. Simple. And that's what I love. The haters watch this. I love it. I love that. The hate. haters watch every minute and they even quote the time when I said ah, something. Yes. At 14 minutes, such and such, she <laughs> said something. Excuse me, so you watch for 14 minutes? <coughs> watch longer. Um, there was two more. Uh, <laughs> and you responded to this one, which I thought was very funny. But why couldn't Miss Barfield have a storyline? Officer Barfield, Joan Barfield, played by Delva Hunter. I thought she was great. I would have loved to have seen a storyline with Delva. I, I just Look, thought she, she was there brilliant. are people, there are various degrees of, oh, the even better one was the person who said, uh, why couldn't the non-speaking officers have uh, stories of their own? And I said, the clue is in the words non-speaking. <laughs> Pretty hard to tell a story without speaking. Look, I don't think that Delva, Delva was a bad actress. She was a good actress. But you can only take so many characters. Yeah. You've got to have them to fill it up. You can't just say, okay, you know, Colleen Powell and um, Anne Reynolds and Meg. And so they're the only people in the entire prison because yeah. we know more. that the prison has other wings. They don't have separate um, common oh. rooms and areas so when you're in the admin area you're going to see officers from other wings but because they were in other wings and we did see them passing through and we saw them interact for a minute you have to say to yourself what can I give to this character that I can't or I haven't already used for the warders we've got what could possibly be different now, it would have been good to have had, when we couldn't do the Sarah Higgins story, it would have been good maybe, this this possibly was a missed opportunity, it would have been good to have given one of, like Officer Barfield, the stories by putting them in prison. But there's nothing else you can do with them because if you give them their own story, unless they have committed a crime, their story is outside the prison. So in order for them to have a story of their own, they would have to commit a crime and become one of the prisoners. Would that have worked? Yeah, it worked with Joan in the finish with her being, you know, carted off to prison. But at the time... We were concentrating on those characters we have. There's always a risk when you take someone who has had maybe 50 words, we call them a 50-worder for obvious reasons, and you actually had to count the words in the script. And if it came up that they'd got 52 words, you had to take two words out because the minute they went over 50 words, they got paid at a different rate they got paid what is called a daily rate so you had your non-speaking extras who could not speak at all you had your 50 worders who could not say more than 50 words not 50 words in one speech but 50 words in one episode 
Then you had your dailies who could speak up to 250 words, but they were only hired for one day at a time. Then you had people who were hired for one episode at a time. And then you had your core regulars who were who were in three to four episodes per week. So to take that chance with Delva and to have given her a story, what would the story have been? We don't want to know about her. No, no, I think, I think the, the thing with Delva's character was that she was there in the background a lot, but also at the end, she was on the, you know, the end credits where she's walking around the prison, locking all the cells and the credits. Yes, because she yeah, was... Every, she was quite yeah, she was there you saw her all the time wasn't it more interesting really in retrospect to think who is that woman i wonder what her story is than to actually be told well she's got a husband and two kids and they can't pay the mortgage and what's that got to do with prisoner yeah, true true that's true and that's why we didn't do it but when we saw exceptional talent like lou siverson when we saw that kind of talent, then um, we had to use it. Yeah. Incidentally, there was a um, a question, which I wasn't going to answer, but I will, which was um, why Faye Quinn never reappeared. And, you know, given that um, Annie Lucas created the character for herself, that's well, that the answer. Of, um, that was because... Um... Now, she did tell the story on the podcast. Jane Clifton had to go and do a play or something at the time, and Ian didn't. Ian wanted to keep her around, so he said, go go do the play and come back, and then I think they created... Absolutely, um, absolutely. Number one, I don't know that she would have wanted to keep popping in and out. Maybe she would have. But I, I think I have said before that production companies have very, very strange attitude towards things once you leave you're dead to them basically yeah and to certain people within the hierarchy ian and annie and even annie lucas that is and even denise once you say well yeah cat. well I'm, I'm leaving yeah absolutely you're you're oh, the cat oh the cat <laughs> Ollie, you're determined to get on camera, aren't you, mate? <laughs> what? Yeah, okay. Well, don't jump over here and hit. hit. He's going to jump up. I know he is. Uh, once you leave, they have this thing that out of sight, out of mind. And so it was never an option to bring Faye Quinn back in. Even though she was only in another block, it was never an option. That was the old prisoner. And this was the new prisoner. And when they handed it over to me, they did say, okay, but if it doesn't work, you take the blame, etc., etc." But I think I've told you in Blue Healers, they wanted Maggie to run off, you know, Maggie wanted to run off with some biker or, or just get married and we never hear from her again. And that isn't how it works. The audience invests in a character. And if... Faye Quinn had kept popping up, we would have said, well, why don't, don't they just move her back into Barnhurst? And I think from memory that at that time, Anne and Ian maybe had young kids. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, but I think they had very young kids. And even though oh, she... Kids was one in, in Prisoner as um, Chrissy's baby, Chrissy Latham's baby. Well, the very first baby ever seen in Prisoner, in I think it's episode one, is um, Lionel Fellows, Will oh, Dumas. Really? Oh, really? Will, Will Dumas' first daughter, Dior, who I named, I picked the name, um, she was the baby. The very oh, first man. baby ever seen in Prisoner was the baby of Will and... Leslie Duma. Funny you're talking about Will and Annie. I was watching an episode last night, just doing some research on something, and uh, uh, Faye's in in a in a shop stealing video recorders, and uh, Will Duma wasn't Lionel; he was someone else because he yeah. had like eight parts in Prisoner. Yeah. <laughs> Because Will's one of those people that, I mean, I wouldn't have cast him in eight parts because 
he is too um, distinctive in his look. I would have recognised him. But be because we didn't know how long the show was going to run, etc., the thing about Will is that he's every man. He's just a bloke. Lionel, you know, Lionel Fellows was one of... I, I, I would have loved to have seen more of Lionel. His character was... Again, Lionel Brilliant. Fellows was a terrific character, but you couldn't see more of him because this yeah, was know, a I show know. about women yeah, in I know, I know. prison. I would have loved to have seen him own a brothel and he's putting the girls in, in Wentworth. And I just think there could have been a bit more to his... Uh, his story. Great to say with hindsight, Matt, I know, I know, but I know. at the time, we had to be conscious always. This is a show about women who are taken out of their comfort zone and put inside a prison. How do they cope? How does it change their lives? How do they interact with the other women? How do they deal with the law? How does the law deal with them? That was the set of tropes, if you like, which if I had anyone you come into the story department that is what i would tell them exactly that it's a show about yeah. women in right. prison so don't tell me oh erica goes on a holiday to the red center and climbs uluru because i don't give a shit yeah. it's a show about women in prison. in prison there we go all right enjoy your cruise I will enjoy my cruise. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a subject for next um, next time. So how about worst? Have we done worst and best? Not story, but scene. Have we done that? Have we done oh, the scene that that's the scene that stays with you? that the second you think of Prisoner, that's the scene you think of. A lot of people will say the hand in the press. I'll say that straight away. And it's interesting, isn't it? That's that's the thing. Think of Prisoner, you think of the hand in the press. That is the scene that is and, always And can played. I say that many, many years later, there was a very brilliant show called Spooks, which is an English show about spies. Don't know if you've ever seen it. If you never saw Spooks... Look it up. It's available on ABC iView, I believe. Fantastic show. But I am told by someone who worked on Spooks, one of the things in the very first episode, and the English people watching will have seen Spooks, I'm sure. One of the things in the very first episode where I went, oh, my God, holy shit. They corner this guy. I can't remember what he was. Maybe he was a... Um, um, double agent or something they corner this guy in the, a fish and chip shop and the one of the spies grabs him by the hand and plunges his hand into hot fat the, the cauldron of hot fat and I said to this guy and it was at a screenwriters conference and I said that scene where you you plunged his hand into the hot fat. You know, God, that was so absolutely horrific. I'd never seen anything like it. And he said to me, but didn't, aren't you the the lady from Prisoner? And the I said, yeah, he said, where do you think I got it from? Uh, uh, the hand in the press. That's where I got it from. Amazing. I remember seeing it and thinking that's the most vicious Horrific thing I have ever seen, and that's where I got it from. And I had to confess, it wasn't one of my scenes. It was in the first Listen. year or so, and it wasn't mine. But it influenced, Prisoner has influenced an incredible amount of shows, not least of all things like Wentworth and Orange is the New Black and um, Prison Break or whatever it was called. Yeah. But an awful lot of drama shows have been influenced in the way they tell stories, what they tell as their content. Prisoner was a groundbreaker and never put it down while I'm around. No. Never. never. Even if it's the, the first two years and I had nothing to do with it, never put it down. It was groundbreaking. Wentworth was not groundbreaking. All the ground had already been broken. It was better filmed. It had more money spent on it. In many cases, it was far better acted. Um, I 
loved Pamela Rabe's reading of Joan Ferguson. I thought, you know, it's a different reading to Maggie Kirkpatrick's completely. It's a different Joan, but it's equally as scary. It's equally as nasty. It's equally as pitiful in some ways. So, you know, never underestimate. Television would not be what it is today had there not been Prisoner. And long may we continue talking about it. And... I think that's a good place to wrap because I'm losing my voice. Definitely. That was <laughs> episode 11 of Coral Soapbox. Please like and subscribe to these videos, like our YouTube channel, and it'll be available across all the podcast platforms, including Spotify and anywhere you get your podcasts. And we'll do another one in a couple of weeks' time. But and in the meantime, I'll give, your life to, I'll give your love to Vanuatu and I'll drink a lot of coffee. Give me some photos. You're going to have your phone with you? I will have my phone. I'll send you some photos, Matt. Okay? Keep the fans updated. <laughs> Bye, everyone. So, yeah. Now the haters can come out and start writing crap things. <laughs> not going to read them. Not gonna, <laughs> you're not going to burst my bubble. Not on the eve of a cruise. Not at all. Hey, prisoner at sea. How about we do that? <laughs> a prison is a I, cruise ship. That is... There's um, no less of fever or anything on the cruise ship. <laughs> yes. But in actual fact, you could. You could actually have a prison for international prisoners, which was anchored in international war. I think I've just... Oh, that was like... Um, what was that? That oh, watched the movie a long time ago. It was about that uh, pirate radio ship. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, radio... there were pirate radio ships. I used to listen to them. Yeah. It was a great movie done on it. And uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, what was it called? Anyway, it'll come to me. Right, man. It'll come to us in time for the next one. Yeah, we'll talk then. Incidentally, go Kamala Harris. If there are any Americans watching, oh, did you see? Time. <laughs> what? What? Did you? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. Um, my fiance Kim uh, showed me the the video of Donald Trump yesterday, uh, talking about how she, she's become black now. Did you see yeah. that? Yeah. 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 Just suddenly, a couple of years ago, she turned black. Whoa, that must have been a shock when she looked in the mirror. <laughs> Actually, I don't think we've spoken since the assassination attempt. Um... We haven't. Um, I look. <laughs> a long, back in 2016, I put down a premise for a screenplay in which they were disguised, but the two lead characters were Trump and Hillary Clinton. And everyone said that the male character, the Trump character, couldn't possibly get elected. And when he did, Hillary Clinton, Clinton had been diagnosed with um, terminal cancer and she took a gun and at the inauguration, she shot him point blank. This is this is the script, everyone. We're not, we're, this, no is a, this is a script I wanted to do. I still get good ideas. Except I would have liked that one to have been real. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. You deal with the comments while you're away about that. <laughs> oh yeah, I bet. I bet there will be. I bet there are Trump supporters who watch us. God knows why. I could not be more politically incorrect if I tried. But there are Trump supporters who watch us. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. You, and I'll see you when you get back. Yeah, we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Take care. Oh, yeah, care. The, 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 the event, there's limited tickets available too. I will put a link to the website to buy tickets here as well. So. Oh, come if you're in Melbourne or anywhere near, come and talk to me. I would love to give you, you have to be prepared to be hugged. Hugs, I'm yes. a big hugger. And I figured out with Matt, because I'm five foot six and he's seven foot eight, that I'm going to be hugging him somewhere around the nether regions, which is <laughs> going to be a little bit naughty. So <laughs> this old lady is going to be woo. <laughs> All right. See, I'll see, see you. Guys. See ya. Bye. Bye. I used to give her roses 
I wish I could again But that was on the outside And things were different then We'd build our world together Sharing all the love we'd known Till I had to face the nightmare Waking up alone On the inside the sun still shines And the rain falls down But the sun and rain are prisoners too Sharing all the love we'd known Till I had to face the nightmare of Waking up alone On the inside the sun still shines And the rain falls down Sun and rain are prisoners too When morning comes around On the inside the roses grow They don't mind the stone ground But the roses here are prisoners too to give her roses I wish I could again But that was on the outside And things were different then